Celeste is a fantastic game, let's just start with that. A great story and message, inventive level design, trans rights… This video isn't an attempt to belittle its successes or talk down to any of the many people this title obviously resonated with, but I think in its failures, and especially its almost successes, Celeste approaches some interesting game design issues that are worth discussing. For those somehow out of the loop, Celeste is a 2018 indie platformer where you play as a woman called Madeline climbing a mountain, which is used throughout the game as a metaphor for battling anxiety and depression. The game the game is, at once, a tangible recreation of the headspace of a person battling their demons in their lowest moments, and an extremely polished and satisfying platformer, and that precisely is the problem. Depression isn't fun, so a game trying to emulate that experience being fun muddies that idea. And in a way, Celeste's mastery of the rules expected of classic platformers – engaging difficulty curve, balanced level design, levels fluidly teaching you their mechanics through play – showcases the narrative limitations of even the most successfully implemented conventional game design wisdom. Meanwhile, the sections of the game that break from this format, the parts designed to truly bring you into how Madeline experienced these events, feel oddly confused with how isolated they are within the overall experience, despite being by far the most interesting parts of the game. Simply put, while it goes places and is incredibly well written, the game fails to achieve the emotional resonance the story expects due to its reluctance to frustrate the player, an over-reliance on forgiving, entertaining, and fun design. I should point out this video will spoil Celeste in its entirety, so if you haven't played it yet and are intending to, I would recommend pausing here and doing so. It's really good. Cool, thanks, now let's do some hot takes. I think the identity crisis is shown clearest, oddly, in the two best levels. On one side there's Core, a thoroughly standard, albeit excellent puzzle platforming escapade. Being a post-game chapter, the story takes a back seat, the purpose being to highlight the new environment, new mechanics, and develop those fully within the level. Without considerations made for story elements or mood, the tightness and polish of the platforming and puzzle aspect is really given space to shine, built around the central gimmick of the caves and every element within them swapping between fire and ice. Hazards become platforms walls become lifts, pathways close and open, there's so much to play and experiment with. And the game manages to explore them quickly and exhaustively to make an incredibly tight and satisfying chunk of gameplay, built on further by its tougher alternate versions. Every room presents a new, fair challenge that can have its limits explored in a short period of time and then move on to new rooms with new challenges or combinations of challenge. Really there's not much need for alternate versions of the level after a playthrough of the A-side, but by teaching hidden mechanics then expecting mastery of them, their inclusion is justified. It's simply tight, pure level design, without trying or pretending to be anything more. It is the fun mechanics working totally isolated from the story. The best chapter, however, the Mirror Temple, is the complete opposite. Not exactly fun, but powerful and thoroughly engaging. It takes place in the story during and just after an anxiety attack, and utilises every part of the level design and aesthetic to immerse the player in that experience. Eyes, which throughout the game are a symbol of danger, follow Madeline in decorations throughout the level and later on in the enemies that chase you. The first new level gimmicks are these fast-moving blocks that jolt across a line when you use your dash, thrusting you into unfamiliar space, generally leaving you out of control on the first few tries. It's a palpable recreation of the feeling of sudden, uncomfortable change that can often trigger or exacerbate an anxiety attack once you're in one. This is also maybe the only platforming level I've played that's improved by a light and darkness mechanic, because the level of frustration that just upsets the rhythm if you're playing Mario or Kirby here fits the mood perfectly. Madeline is less aware of the environment because you fall into yourself with anxiety, the hazards and bottomless pits become much more uncertain, forcing you to take many leaps of faith, unsure whether you'll land on safe ground or or another hazard to set you back. This synergizes superbly with the other new gimmick of red bubbles that throw you in a chosen direction until interruption. If there is a greater analogue to being presented with a new social situation during an anxiety attack than being catapulted uncontrollably into a dark foreboding cavern covered in eyes, then I'm certainly yet to see it. Later on, the stage forces you to confront Madeline's tendency towards self-harm by forcing you to play as a monster you're yet to see as it hunts her down and attacks, which manages to seamlessly teach the mechanics of the section while being an incredibly evocative and disturbing pocket of gameplay. After this, the danger begins to build as more enemies approach and it feels like the stage is closing in, building layers of anxiety and dread until the final release at the end, appropriately brought about by the solidarity of a good friend. The Mirror Temple is a phenomenal experience for the task of 
of building empathy. Madeline's emotions aren't merely shown, they're translated into gameplay and broadcast directly through the level's design. The fear, the insecurity, the anxiety, all are shared between Avatar and player. Partly because of the deliberate psychological cues within this stage, and partly because of how well it executes them, I'm going to assume this level of narrative immersion was the intention in most of the other levels as well. Core and Mirror Temple sit at two extremes in what they're trying to accomplish, one totally for fun and one totally for narrative. And problems in the game only emerge within levels aiming to combine both of these objectives which, when you start to look at it, is less a case of combining functional elements, as it is compromising one half of the game to suit another, when the two sides don't really coalesce. An early example of Clash is Chapter 3. It's a story of Madeline's self-destructive compulsion to fix other people's problems, and how well-intentioned attempts to do good can often end up hurting those around us if our needs and goals aren't honestly communicated. Madeline finds an abandoned hotel on her way up the mountain, meeting its ghostly owner, Mr. Ashiro. He insists she stays for the night, but Madeline tries to politely let him down, which he takes as confirmation of her stay. Madeline tries to help the man by cleaning up the hotel, and when that doesn't work, snaps at him, saying she never wanted to stay, causing them both to blow up and fight, after which Madeline leaves. In gameplay, the first section is represented by traversing small platforming segments, avoiding manifestations of Ashira's distress that move in steady patterns, and the fight after he blows up is represented by traversing small platforming segments, avoiding manifestations of Ashira's distress that move in steady patterns, and Ashira himself. And you can probably see the problem already. The setup and twist being more or less the same experience creates an enormous ludonarrative dissonance between the player and protagonist that undermines any lesson this chapter is going for. Moreover, it's hard to reach the level of sustained empathy the Mirror Temple nails when the player isn't an active participant in any of the decisions Madeline makes. The emotional payoff, Madeline's narrative punishment for not being honest with Ashiro earlier, is at odds with keeping the design constantly satisfying, and so it's forced to compromise both halves in an attempt to have its cake and eat it too. Each side of the game is weakened by concessions made to satisfy the other. The immersion breaks because the player's goals remain the same while the story flips, and the no-frills platforming suffers because neither the claustrophobic interior segment nor the Ashiro bouncing chase segment are given time to be developed fully or integrated with each other particularly smoothly. The clearest instance of this dissonance, however, is towards the end. Throughout the game, the conflict between Madeline and her mental illness is represented by her fighting an alternate version of herself the community calls Badeline, who is fittingly the only character sprite given eyes. Throughout the first half of the game, she's the antagonist, the force holding Madeline back that needs to be defeated if she can succeed. Then, following the anxiety attack in chapters 4 and 5, there's a subdued but touching interactive cutscene of Madeline and your new friend from the mountain, Theo, opening up to each other about their insecurities and problems, at the end of which, Madeline's determination to finish her ascent increases and she confronts Madeline directly, telling her she doesn't need these thoughts and feelings and she can finally let go of what's holding her back. Badeline then refuses, mocking her, and the in-game portrayal of you attempting to regain control is destroyed as you're thrown to the bottom of the mountain, losing all progress thus far. Chapter 6 shows Madeline at her lowest, almost giving up before eventually realising her anxieties and flaws can't simply be abandoned because they're part of her, and it's only in accepting that that she can move on and grow. Its climax is confronting Badeline one final time, not in anger, but out of love. The chapter ends with the two reconciling and a heartwarming embrace. Only now can they escape the pit together, with their full capability unleashed. Madeline's hair on her sprite switches to pink and a second mid-air dash is unlocked, which stays until the summit is reached. It takes a familiar story about mental illness that is so often consumed by the language of conflict and feats of strength and transforms it into a story about compassion, Madeline extending the compassion she gives to others to herself, and harder still, to the parts of herself she'd already decided were the problem. It's a beautiful, powerful, and necessary message. But as a video game, it just doesn't harmonise with the mechanics as they're presented. Firstly, there's the Mr. Ashiro problem. For Madeline, this scene is losing all the progress thus far, but for the player, it's level 5 to level 6. With new mechanics, visuals, and music just as every other new level presents to you. It's understandable why this was done. Repeating content would have upset the game's flow and skewed the difficulty curve. But it comes at the cost of this 
supposed loss of progress not being at all immersive or affecting the player in any real way. Then when you start to reclimb the mountain in the final main story chapter, armed with two mid-air dashes for the first time, the tightness and elegance of Celeste's level design presents the protagonist's shift working as a ludonarrative plot point. Madeline learning of her full potential once she's accepted herself is supposed to be cathartic and freeing, but going from simply moderately challenging levels built around using exactly one dash to moderately challenging levels built around using exactly two dashes makes this feel more like a level gimmick than anything else, especially given objects that give you another dash when interacted with were the main new obstacle in most other levels. The feelings of the protagonist don't fully sync with those generated for the player, and as such, the point of the story, fantastic and insightful as it is, is undermined. It's a difficult beast handling game design that deliberately creates uncomfortable emotions to sell a narrative, but games like Getting Over It with Bennett Foddy with its infuriating setbacks, and Papers Please with its bleak and morality questioning world and decisions show it can be done effectively if enough care is given to craft these moments of frustration around an experience which is compelling enough to encourage players to work through them. Celeste's overcautious design philosophy and commitment to make every section capital F fun, with levels following the same playbook near every conventionally satisfying platform has been attempting to follow, holds it back when the story is at its most powerful and really dampened the impact of the final hours to me. Celeste aims to be at once Shovel Knight and Papers Please, and in doing so, fails to surpass either. I actually almost made this video when I first played the game, but held off. Sure, it's not perfect, but it accomplishes things most games don't even try, and is it really worth writing and editing a video to talk shit about a game which clearly did a lot of good for a lot of people and that I don't even dislike? And then I played Farewell. Farewell is everything I wanted this game to be, and I'm so glad it exists. I like the graphics and the music and story and writing and level design, and I think it's pretty good overall. Farewell is the ninth chapter of Celeste, released as free DLC for the game in September of last year. It's presented as an epilogue to the main story, but given the story complexity and time it takes to complete it, it's kind of also a quasi-sequel slash follow-up. What separates Farewell from the rest of the game is it doesn't remotely hold back and is entirely unafraid to kick you square in the face to sell you the story it wants to tell. But before I get into it, I should give another brief spoiler warning for those who have played Celeste but not gotten around to the DLC or didn't think it was worth their time. Okay, good. The story takes place a year after the main game, with Madeline returning to the mountain she conquered. Straight away, you're greeted with a tombstone and exposition. Granny died, Madeline missed the funeral which she punishes herself for, and she's clearly in a lot of pain. Straight after, she invents a story that the bird following her is Granny, and heads into the stars to follow it and find her. The narrative that ensues involves Madeline falling out and later making up with her dark conscience, and traversing through the hardest platforming segments in the entire entire game to finally break through and obtain the emotional closure she denied herself at first. In design, this is the most abstract and esoteric level by far. The elements of outer space, exploding fish, floating jellyfish, electricity, and flashing tiles don't remotely synchronize, selling the dream aspect early. This is literally Madeline's psyche fighting itself. This is aided by the more abstract composition of most rooms, which are generally just a few floating platforms amidst wide gaps of empty space. While earlier levels have clear pathways and obvious routes through, the routing here is very weird and often non-linear. It feels more like your progression here is in spite of the level design. This is again furthered halfway in when your progress is brought to a halt until you master a secret speedrunning mechanic wherein you can dash forward in such a way you maintain your dash to travel even further. Progressing through these sections is obviously just as artificial as any other Celeste level, or platforming level in general, but the way it's constructed here, the way new mechanics are brought in when you reach a dead end makes it feel like you're fighting a world that is actively resisting your progress, perfectly encapsulating, navigating the complex feelings of self-loathing and anger that come with grief. The gentle difficulty curve and forgiving checkpoint placements of the main game are completely gone, and in their place is a game that constantly throws you around and punishes you for assuming you deserve a reward. The stakes and pacing are constantly escalated as an emotional release is dangled in front of your face before the game pulls back and keeps pushing you to go further and further inside Madeline's frustration. The self-doubt, the anxiety, and the dread. At one point it gives you a heart that up to this point have all been at the end of levels, but then then it just doesn't end. You don't deserve that yet. 
you're not ready. Later, it follows an incredibly long and challenging segpoint with no checkpoint, with the introduction of a brand new mechanic navigating the jellyfish while being blown upwards, and it's so cruel and awful and brilliant. Played back to back after the main game, it's surprising how different Farewell feels and how it's designed. Gone are the comforting formalities of modern platformers, and they're replaced by this constant uncertainty. The storytelling and writing is a little more subtle, which has the danger of muddying the message, but I think it works to its benefit, because given it's unclear exactly what Madeline's thinking and feeling, it becomes easier to map the waves of pain and pleasure you get playing through this level onto her directly. The one caveat to everything negative I've had to say about Celeste would be, even in its weakest point, the soundtrack absolutely slaps the whole way through, and honestly embodies the story far better than the level design does, and I only bring it up here to say that Farewell's soundtrack is the very best of it. The visual symbolism is rich and meaningful, the levels are tight and superbly engaging, and the catharsis that comes from finishing the chapter is utterly indescribable. While the Mirror Temple invites you into a moment of time to feel what Madeline does, and the core provides a satisfying challenge to overcome, Farewell, by not shying away from frustrating and often spiteful design, manages to thread both of these concepts together to tell a full story of loss, failure, self-hatred, and release. Negative emotions are valid and important, and a piece of media providing them is not de facto a flaw. Despite most video game criticism, including everything I've ever done, treating it as if it was. For games to tell more emotionally nuanced stories will need more emotionally nuanced forms of storytelling, provided by embracing the painful, ugly, and frustrating elements of the human experience. Celeste at first seems unwilling to take the risk of emulating irritation and pain, and the power of the story slightly slightly suffers, and it's only in its post-game where it's willing to risk alienating players just looking for simple fun, that the writing and design is pushed to its fullest potential. So that, to me, is the problem with Celeste, and how, with an utterly fantastic and astonishingly free DLC, it was eventually solved. Do you get it? I break a ten-month unexplained YouTube hiatus with a video about a game about anxiety and depression. I'm so subtle and clever, and really very subtle, and I'm sorry. I guess this video didn't break it, but anyway. You know, I've been filming in this background for six years now. Crazy. Subscribe to my channel. <laughs>